this man was born in Gorky in 1937. He has lived in the Soviet Union, in England, in Iceland, and in Switzerland, but he spends most of his professional life traveling. He is unusually private and unassuming for his profession, and yet he is known and affectionately remembered by millions of people all over the world. His name is Vladimir Ashkenazi, and he is one of the foremost pianists of our time. He is recognized internationally for his talent, his earnestness, and his quiet charm. And all of these things together in his appearances on television, which has played a major role in the development of his career. We have been making television films with him for the past 20 years, an experience that we have found both enjoyable and rewarding, and one worth remembering. And so, as an affectionate record of our association with him, we present Ashkenazi Observed. It all started here with Daniel Barenboim, backstage at the Fairfield Halls in Croydon, when they played Mozart's double concerto together for the first time on the 11th of March, 1966. This was also the opening sequence of our first film for BBC television, Double Concerto. <laughs> Vladimir Ashkenazi and his Icelandic wife, Thorun, were married in Moscow in 1962, but left the Soviet Union in the following year, and for five years lived here with their family in Hendon. But in June of 1968, the combined pressures of constant touring and living in London persuaded them to move to Iceland in search of some peace and quiet and a better relationship with their children. You can imagine. Yes, you can imagine all this travel, all noise and all difficulties and luggages and planes and hotels and everything. And in the, in the midst of a tour, I sometimes think, God, I can't, you know, I can't stand it anymore. I have to go and rest somewhere. Really, you know, even, even when I have a day or two, if I feel really tired, I'll just take a plane and go to Iceland for one day. Well, I wouldn't have gone to London for one day. Because there I won't rest. And this is, a, this is an ideal place for such a retreat. It's, it's already marvelous. You feel already much healthier. And that is very important because playing is not just mental work, it's also physical work. You have to be in a good form always. Too bad. You have to have energy and vitamin C. <laughs> so you come here. <laughs> For the snow and midnight sun and waterfalls and green mountains and snowy mountains. And it's worth it. It's worth having this. My wife couldn't really 
buy this house without me, but she already saw it. And then in January I had literally one evening free. So we decided to fly here for a few hours. In fact, it was just for three hours. So that I can see the house and to go next morning to Copenhagen. I had to play in Copenhagen. So I came here in the middle of the polar night. <laughs> Those very romantic you know, circumstances were very romantic, I must say. So we chose this house. Now we came here just for a few days and we thought we could put all our furniture and stuff and things. But nothing has arrived, so it's all empty. Look, I have my bed home here, that's all. <laughs> I haven't had time to unpack it. Look, there is nothing in the house, absolutely. I mean, just parquet, nothing else. So the kitchen is empty. Come. I couldn't offer you a cup of tea, or let alone breakfast. Very much room, nothing. No piano. I would have been practicing a little bit. That's our first day in Iceland. First time we could stay here. There is nothing. It's a bit stuffy here, no? Dolly! But, you know, we travel all the time, almost. So, more I uh, travel without them, more I want to see them. And, you know, um, older they grow, more I want to see them anyway. It's the funniest feeling. You know. it's, it's not what you call family life. You know, family life has some funny connotations. You know, that you sit in front of a fire, you know, have your tea with children around you, or something like that, play with them. To play with them, I don't know. I'm not so interested to in playing their toys with them. I don't care much about that. But I want to spend some time with them, to talk to them, you know, to tell them what I feel about things and to know what they feel about things, and, you know, to grow together somehow. Like human being with a human being. And if the children see that, that's already a good thing. And it's a pity we don't see them more, of course, but what could I do? <laughs> I couldn't stop playing, <laughs> right? And now, when I go to London now, I will do as I, what I ever do in London, but at least I feel much better because I know that when I go to Iceland again for those five days, I'll see the children every day for hours and hours and hours. So in London, I'll do the same things as ever. A few days later, he's back in London recording the César Frank Sonata with Itzhak Perlman. This is their first recording together and the start of a long association during which they will record, among other things, all of the Beethoven sonatas. You see, you can't hear my high notes because you're so loud. Yes, I think we should have to take it down just a little bit.
sad we stopped there. Why didn't you go home? London again in August to place Travinsky's own arrangement of the Rite of Spring with Daniel Barenboim, a further extension of their already very fruitful relationship. Play just some of this. Yeah, let's play from around here. Yes. First time. No, second. Second time. Okay. <laughs> piano for this hall. <laughs> oh, it's hard, isn't it? Antwerp, 1970, to play a Chopin recital in the Queen Elizabeth Hall. On tour as usual, and as usual with his wife at his side. Companion, confidant, and musical critic whose judgment he greatly respects.
my wife is my most valuable advisor, my most valuable critic too. And she tells me exactly what she thinks. And she has a very natural response to music. And she helps me immensely. I couldn't overvalue her help, really. Well, how much importance you can attach to the criticisms is a very arguable thing. And when I sum it all up, I come to a conclusion that I shouldn't take too much notice of the critics. Only I and my very close friends who know what I can do, how much I can develop, what good I have done this particular evening. Only they can tell me and I myself can tell me what was good, what wasn't good and what I have to achieve. And critics, they can't teach me. We don't usually bother. If we get the papers, if they're there, if somebody tells us, then we... I don't know, I don't care at all. But he cares. If he gets a bad one, he gets very upset. If he gets a good one, he says they're all fools. They don't understand anyways. <laughs> you can't please him at all. I'm very grateful that I, you know, I've been studying music ever since I was two or three. I mean, I've known nothing else, and I'm very grateful for it all, because it is a great help. And I suppose I enjoy it. The University of Essex in Wivenhoe Park, Colchester, where he is to play Beethoven for the students. Ever since he left Russia in 1963, one of his main preoccupations as an artist has been with the music of Beethoven and the European tradition of performing it. He has described it as a process of overcoming inadequacies, but this throws more light on his earnestness than on his technical ability. And it's characteristic of that same earnestness that the composer he most admires, he has found the most difficult. You said a few years ago that you were overcoming inhibitions about playing Beethoven. How do you feel about that now? Uh, I don't know if it's if, if this is right to describe it as inhibition. It's rather, I felt, in, inadequate, and I was right. Inhibition is something else. Inhibition is something that um, you might be adequate and you still can't do it because you have some complex. In my case, it, I simply felt it was certainly, I was certainly inadequately prepared. Um, but to say that I'm prepared now would be um, silly enough, because with such great music, you can never reach the bottom. I mean, this is only a truism. I'm not saying anything new. Um, I certainly feel much better than nine years ago. And I hope that I'll go on feeling even better playing this music. I feel very deeply um, what should be expressed in it. And I believe that if I do feel very deeply, and that if I continue my research in this field, and continue on working as hard as I have been, um, I should be able to produce something worthwhile.
London again, 1977, to play a Beethoven trio at the Royal Opera House Covent Garden for a film about his friend Itzhak Perlman. The formation of the trio is a new departure, an extension of his artistic relationship with Itzhak Perlman and the start of a new one with Lynn Harrell that is to develop steadily in the coming years and include recordings of all the Beethoven trios. The motivation for this and his readiness to cooperate in a film about Itzhak Perlman lies squarely in a genuine wish to be a good colleague and in the value of artistic collaboration. These are the same principles that led him to conducting for the first time and to accept our invitation to make a series of films about composers. In fact, it may be said that he is actually happier contributing to films about colleagues and composers than making films about himself. The first of the composer portraits was a film about Respighi, made in Stockholm and in Italy in 1980 with Ashkenazi conducting the Swedish Radio Symphony Orchestra and directing from the keyboard. He had begun directing from the keyboard in Mozart Concerti, but gave his first concert as a conductor in 1971, when he stood in at short notice to conduct a Beethoven program in Iceland with Daniel Barenboim as soloist. This led to a number of invitations to conduct British orchestras, and within a few years, he found himself with a rapidly developing second career, and one that he found both musically rewarding and instructive.
The second of the composer films was about Mussorgsky's pictures at an exhibition. For many years after leaving the Soviet Union, Ashkenazi's mastery of Russian keyboard music was partially eclipsed by his concern to come to terms with the music of the West and the European musical traditions. But slowly, Rachmaninoff, Skriabin and Mussorgsky began to reappear more frequently in his concert programs. And in September 1981, we filmed an astonishing performance of the pictures at an exhibition in the newly opened concert hall at the Barbican Centre in London.
After Mussorgsky came two films about Sibelius, a composer who has always been close to Ashkenazi's heart. He feels a strong sense of identification with Finland and Finnish landscape, spending some free time there each year. Perhaps it has echoes of his native Russia for him. In any event, having already made gramophone recordings of all the Sibelius symphonies, he responded enthusiastically to the opportunity to conduct the Swedish Radio Symphony Orchestra in two films that set out to place Sibelius' music in its Finnish context. Finlandia caught the imagination, and not only of the Finns. Its message rang around the world and carried the name of Sibelius with it. He himself was surprised at its success. Why does this symphonic poem speak to people, he asked. Perhaps because of its open-air style. But then it really is built on themes provided from above. Pure inspiration. Sibelius was 33 when he wrote Finlandia and it shows little of the genius for structure and symphonic form that was yet to come. But the gift for unforgettable melody is already there, and it speaks with conviction and passion in the clear and unmistakable voice of a young Finnish composer who was to become in time one of the great symphonists of the 20th century. And so one of the foremost pianists of our time has become, in addition, a conductor of international repute. And on the 1st of January, 1987, he was appointed music director of the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra in London. He is now generally acknowledged to be at a new peak in his career. And it seems more than likely that the breadth of his activities, and in particular his conducting, has contributed to a widely recognized deepening in his performances of the great works in the Western piano literature because in all of this, the piano has remained his prime concern and the pursuit of Beethoven a constant theme in his life. And so here, to conclude our tribute to this master musician, is Beethoven's late sonata, Opus 109, recorded at a public concert in Switzerland.
What am I? I'm a, a human being, right? I'm a musician, pianist. What? I'm a man, <laughs> husband and a father. Um, a Russian, half Jewish, and a football player. <laughs> um, a traveler. And I am a citizen of the world. I hope. <laughs>